Romans chapter 8, in verse number 28, if you found your spot, say amen. amen. It says, and we know that what? All things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his, what's that word? word. Everybody say that word real loud. Fair of you, help me now. Here we go. For, according to his purpose. his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Three things that we're going to talk about tonight. In the process of the believer, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, you know, the Bible says he hath begun a good work in us. We'll, we'll see that verse in a minute. But he has begun a good work in us. And so we're going to look at three words tonight that represent God's purpose for you and me. We're going to look at justification. Say that with me. We're going to look at justification. justification. Then we're going to look at sanctification. Say that with me. And then we're going to look at glorification. Glorification. So we're going to look at justification, sanctification, and glorification. And I'm telling you, you're going to enjoy it. When we get to that last part, it's going to be great, all right? So, how many of y'all know Jesus tonight? <clears throat> so this pertains to you. So if you know Jesus, I need you to pray for me. Pray that God will give me oxygen. Say amen. amen. And pray that we can uh, finish this thing tonight, all right? Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for your mercy. We're so thankful that you've got a plan for our lives. You have got a purpose for us. Even though we don't always see it, and Lord, even though we don't always try to cooperate with it, Lord, you, you've got a plan. And we're, we are uh, in that process right as we speak, from salvation to the point that we're going to see you in glory. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to study, to grow, to learn, to develop uh, tonight. It is such a privilege to be here uh, Lord, I look around, and there's so many people here that probably worked hard all day long, and they're wore out and tired. Uh, Lord, bless them especially tonight. Give them a special blessing. Uh, give them double rest tonight for their labor. And Lord, we'll praise you and thank you. Don't let me say anything I shouldn't. Lord, don't let me forget anything I should. And God, will be careful to give you the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Here in these verses, here in these verses, we, we see the specific words given, justified and glorified, or glorification. Uh, but but in we say, where do you get sanctification? In verse number 29, it says, He did predestinate us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Conformed to the image of His Son. Transform. Move from one place to the next. Uh, become more like his son. That is the process of sanctification, amen? So we'll get to that in point number two. But first of all, I want you to look at the first word, justification, justification. If you're taking notes, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Very important. We see the meaning of justification, the meaning of justification. If you will, right beside that, right beside that, Render just or innocent. To render just or innocent. All right? That is, the, that is the, the technical definition, but let's describe it. All right? What does that really look like? Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Christ on the basis of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Now, this is very important. This is very important. Everybody pay attention. Justification is an act. Everybody say that. Justification is an act, not a process. You are not being saved. All right? When, when you come to Christ in faith, he saves you. He saves you. It is an act of God to save you 
to justify you. You're not, in other words, you're not doing things to be saved. That's very important. That destroys, I mean, tons and tons of false doctrine. Uh, you do not have to earn, matter of fact, <clears throat> excuse me, you cannot earn salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, works lest any man should boast. So salvation comes at the act of God. When you place your faith in Christ, he justifies you. He saves you. You are born again. Now, now watch this. <clears throat> justification is an act, not a process. There are no degrees of justification. Each believer has the same right, what? Standing before God. Justification does not mean that God makes us righteous, but that he, he declares us righteous. There's a big difference, all right? Justification is a legal matter. God puts the righteousness of Christ on our record in the place of our own sinfulness. When it comes to our standing with God, he looks on us and deals with us as though we had never sinned at all. And all God's people see it. Now, so let's, let's, let's talk about that just a second. Let's talk about that just a second, and then we'll move on. So the moment you got saved, God declared you righteous. In other words, when it comes to your standing with him, because you got to understand, when you're lost, you're not on good footing with the Lord. Does everybody understand that? We are at enmity with God. That's why the Bible says, now therefore there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, right? So if that means after we're saved there's no condemnation, that means before we're saved there is condemnation. There's condemnation. We're condemned. We're sinners. We're unrighteous. We're enemies to God. We are on a bad standing with God, a bad footing with God, a bad relationship, if you will, with God. But the moment you believe, God declares you innocent. He declares you righteous. In other words, he declares you a right standing with God. In other words, it's kind of like this. God says, we're good now. We're good now. Not because you're good. Not because you have been good to earn this goodness. But because of Jesus' fulfilling all the righteousness requirements of the law, because of what he did on Calvary, say amen. He says, in other words, this is basically what it is. He gives you, he gives you the righteousness that his son earned. Does that make sense? He declares it. It's an act. It's, an, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Say that. It's a done deal. Period. When it comes to our justification, everybody in here is on the same level. If you're here today and you're saved, you've been justified, you are now right with God. You are in a right relationship with God. You're, you're in a right, let's see, not right relationship, right standing with God. Sometimes people are out in, when it comes to relationship. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for everybody, the moment you are justified, he declares you righteous. In other words, he sees you like he sees his son. Does that make sense? Say amen. amen. Now, that's the, that's the meaning of of justification. Now, look at the means. B, write this down. B, the means of justification. It says in Romans 3.21, <clears throat> Romans 3.21, but now the what? Righteousness of God. In other words, that's the easy way to understand that is what's it take to be right with God? That's what basically the righteousness of God is what is required for you to be right with God. The righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, watch this, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference 
For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being, say it with me, being justified freely by his, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right now, Romans 5.1, Romans 5.1, therefore being by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, how do we receive a right standing with God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ? Not by good deeds, not by works. You see, other religions will tell you you have to earn it. You have to be good. Listen, the Bible says there, there is no righteousness in works. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's, amen? It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should. All right, so... The, the meaning of justification is he declares us righteous. He says, you are now in a right standing with me. I see you as I see my son. I put, I put my son's, this is God speaking, I put my son's righteousness on your account. That's great stuff. And how does that happen? Faith. Faith, belief. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is not earned by keeping the law. That's the whole point of the chapter in chapter number three, because the Jewish people felt like you had to keep the law, you know, you, you had to you had to become as Jews and, and be circumcised and all of these things. And no, no, no. It's not by any of those things. It's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and faith alone. Faith alone. Church say amen. Now then we see the ministry of justification. The meaning of justification where God renders us, declares us righteous. Then we see the means is by faith. By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I want you to see the ministry of justification. This is great. What, is it, what does it actually do? All right. Romans 3.24, <clears throat> Romans 3.24, being justified, meaning what? What does that mean? Declared righteous, right? Rendered innocent or just, declared righteous. Being declared righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a, what's that word? propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now let's look at two things here. Let's look at two things in the ministry of justification. First of all, propitiation. Big word. We don't normally use that word nowadays, but this is, this is a very important term. In human terms, in human terms, propitiation means appeasing someone who is angry usually by gift, but this is not what it means in the Bible, all right? Propitiation means the satisfying of God's holy what? Law. The meaning of its just demand. Now, what does that mean? It means this. The wages of sin is death, death. period. Period. God requires sin to be paid for. When, when he declares us righteous, he didn't just say, well, I'm just going to overlook your sin. Does everybody understand that? He did not overlook anything. Our sin had to be dealt with. Our sin had to be paid for. So Jesus went to the cross and paid our debt. Say amen. And in doing so, in doing so, he sufficed the judgment of God, the anger of God, the righteousness and holiness of God against sin. Does that make sense? Say amen. All right, now watch. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. This is not what it means in the Bible. I want to read this again so you get it. You make sure you get this. Propitiation means the satisfying of God's holy law. 
In other words, the law required, the penalty for sin is death. All right? The meaning of its just demands. That's what Jesus did on Calvary. He met the demands of the law so that God can freely forgive those who come to Christ. The word blood tells us what the price was. Jesus had to die on the cross in order to satisfy the law and justify lost sinners. You see, justification is such an important doctrine. God didn't sweep anything under the rug. God did not overlook our sin. God did not ignore our sin because in his holiness, in his righteousness, in his justice, he could not do that and be a holy God. So it had to be paid for. So guess what? He sent his son to pay our debt to satisfy the requirement of the law. Say amen. Propitiation. Watch this now. There's another word. There's another word. Redemption. Redemption. <clears throat> it says the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now watch. <clears throat> The best illustration of these two truths, propitiation and redemption, is, is, is the Jewish day of atonement described in Leviticus 16. Two goats were presented at the altar. One of them was chosen for a sacrifice. The goat was slain and its blood taken into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the mercy seat, that golden cover on the Ark of the Covenant. This sprinkled blood covered the two tablets of the law, right? The law requires, required death, right? For the wages of sin is? So law, the demands of the law was covered by the blood. The sprinkled blood covered the two tablets of the law inside. The shed blood meant, what's that word? Temporarily. temporarily. That's what we got to see, Temporarily. You see, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. It could only temporarily, temporarily cover or satisfy the requirement of the law, the righteous demands of God, propitiation. Then the priest, then the priest put his hands on the head of the other goat. You see, they brought two goats. One goat was slain. His blood was taken and was covered as a sacrifice, as an offering, right? Then they took the other goat, and the priest would put his hands on the head of the goat and confess the sins of the people. Then the goat was taken out into the wilderness and set free to symbolize the carrying away of sins. Does the Bible say in Psalms 103, As far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. In the Old Testament period, the blood of animals could never take away sin. It could only cover it until the time when Jesus would come and purchase a finished salvation. Watch this now. Watch this. God had passed over the sins that were past. That's what we just read in Romans 3.25. All right, let me read that again and then we'll, we'll finish that. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Now, let me read this again. It says that when Jesus would come, the blood of the animals would only cover it until the time when Jesus would come and purchase a finished salvation God passed over the sins that were past, knowing that his son would come and finish the work. Because of his death and resurrection, there would be redemption, which means a purchasing of the sinner and setting him free. Preacher, what are you saying? Every year they had to take the blood of the goat to cover the law. Listen, temporarily, temporarily, because every year, that altar would cry for sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Every year they had to come and cover it. Every year, 
cover it, every year cover it. And God looked over those sins because he knew his son was coming. And after his son came and died on the cross, the Lamb of God, which doesn't cover our sin, but the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world, there would be no need for no more sacrifices. That's why on the cross he said, it is finished. Listen, that altar cried, sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. And when Jesus took his blood before the altar in heaven, the altar cried, satisfied, satisfied, satisfied. Amen. Say amen. amen. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying I'm justified. Amen. And if you're saved, you're justified. Amen. You're declared righteous. You're at a right standing with God because of what his son did on Calvary's cross. No matter what, you are justified. No matter what happens, you are in a right standing with God. Are y'all with me? Now, <clears throat> that's a one-time act. It is a once and for all final declaration from God for the believer. Now, Sanctification, the second part of this process. Sanctification is not a one-time act. Sanctification is a process. It's a process. Does everybody understand that? Say amen. amen. So what's God's plan for your life? He wants you justified. He wants you declared righteous. He wants you in a right standing with him. So the moment you put your faith in him and believe in him, he declares you righteous. He puts the righteousness of his son on your account. Amen. Boom, done. Amen. Say amen. amen. But then he starts working on you. You ever heard that kid's song? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. He's still working on us. He's still working on us. Now, now, let's, let's talk about sanctification a little bit. Sanctification, this is, this, is, this is very, very important. This is very, very important. Because you need to understand. <clears throat> you need to understand all these people running around and, and, and saying they're a Christian adulterer and a Christian homosexual and a, and a Christian trans person and a, and a Christian and can live any, any lifestyle whatsoever and, and declare to be a Christian, they, they don't understand Scripture. And they don't understand, they don't understand what the Bible truly says about salvation and sanctification. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are, and behold, all things are become new. Now, and we're going to see this because God begins a work. Now, write this down. I don't think it's in yours because I put it down at the last minute. But, but write, this, write this, uh, this verse down. Just write it somewhere there and you can look it up later. Philippians 1 6. Philippians 1 6. This is what it says. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? That means the moment that you get saved, he starts working on you. Now, how long does it say he'll work on you? Till Jesus comes. That means, that means some of us have a lot of work to do. And some of us had a lot of work been done on us. But I think we can all honestly say no matter what, we still got a lot of work to do. Are y'all with me? So he begins a work of sanctification. Now, let's let's look at the, let's go back and look at Romans. Let's look, go back and look at Romans. Verse 28. <clears throat> Verse 28, you there? Everybody good? Everybody all right? Yeah, I'm going to wear that out. Amen. 
That's Robert Harrington's fault. All right, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, don't stop because he's fixed to tell you what his purpose is. What is his purpose for you? What is he wanting to do with you, in you, through you? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. He predetermined that those that got saved would be what? To be conformed to the image of his son. That's sanctification. Look at, look at your notes. <clears throat> look at your notes. Sanctification is the process. Now, what did we say justification was? It was an, it was an act. It was an act. It was a one-time done deal. But sanctification is a process where by God makes the believer more and more like Christ. You see, justification never changes. But sanctification may change from day to day. It may change from day to day, and it should change from day to day. You should become more like Christ every day. Amen? Oh, you got quiet right there. Amen? Now look. Look here. Philippians 2. Philippians 2.12. It's in your notes right there. Wherefore, <clears throat> wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Here's an important verse. Work out your own salvation with fear and Trembling. Watch this now. For it is God which worketh what? In. God tells you to work. What did he do? He worked in. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, let's explain that. That means. The moment you got saved, God put everything in you, you needed to be what he wants you to be. All right? He, he, he made a change. You're a new creature. You've been declared righteous. He's changed you. You are different. You are not the same. You're brand new. Say amen. amen. But God wants you to work on the outside what he's put on the inside. Now, did you notice how he said that? Do you notice the wording? Work out your, now, now keep in mind, some people miss the word, they say work for your salvation. It doesn't say work for your salvation. You can't work for your salvation. For by grace you saved through faith and not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should. You can't work for it. It's not saying work for it. He's saying work it out. Work it out. In other words, work it out. Out with what? Fear and... You know why I said that? Because it's hard. It's difficult. It's, it's, it's not easy living the Christian life. It's not easy living holy in an unholy environment. In an unholy culture. In traffic. Say amen. Let's get practical here. It's not easy. It's difficult. Listen, this process of sanctification, this thing that we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be working out on the outside, manifesting on the outside what God has put on the inside. Let me explain it this way. <clears throat> Maybe this is a good illustration to help us understand this. A, a, a little, little Petey, little Petey, I, I was holding him today. Uh, uh, Brandy had him. At the at, here this morning in, in prayer meeting this morning, so I was holding him and 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 playing with him when I was supposed to be paying attention, but I wasn't. But I was playing with youngin. But when you're the when you're the pastor, you can do what you want to do, <laughs> and ain't nobody gonna say nothing. So I'm playing with my grand youngin. Amen. Now now little Petey, when he was born, he was born with everything. He was born with everything to be like his daddy. 
He, he had eyes and ears and, 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 and fingers and toes and, and, and heart and liver and kidneys and all. He has everything. Got a brain and everything. But he's a baby. You see, he's got everything he needs. He's got everything he needs. But he's not acting like his daddy. He was crying, pitching a fit, dirty diapers, messes up, wakes up in the middle of the night. He ain't acting like his daddy at all. He's acting like his mama, amen. <laughs> For the record, that was Brother Mickle that said that. That wasn't me. All right, I'll throw you right under the bus, amen. Now watch this. What does he need? He needs training and he needs teaching he needs his father to invest in him to take on the traits and the characteristics of his father now he's got everything he needs but he just needs to grow you see a baby christian god puts in you everything you need but then god wants you to work it out god wants you to work it out that's the process of sanctification, becoming more and more like his son. You see, his son is the goal. His son is the target. His son is the example that we are to follow. And as we, and, and you say, now, how, what did God do to help us in this process? How many of y'all know we need some help with that? Well, we got it. We got it. Don't worry about it. We got it. Look here. Three things I want you to see. Three things I want you to see. Does that make sense, everybody? We good? So everybody knows that. God wants us to work on the outside what he's put on the inside. That's the process of sanctification. Now, he, here's the help he's given us. We are sanctified. A, write this down if you're taking notes. We are sanctified through the Spirit. The Spirit helps us in this process. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are what? Sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the of our God. Preacher, what are you saying? God gave you the Holy Spirit to help work on you. He's not just in there taking up space. He, God gave you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is your comforter. He is your teacher. He is your convictor. He is the one that, that you feel and you understand when you go to get stupid. Do I have a witness? He is the one that makes you feel horrible when you sin. He is telling you, don't do that. When you did it, he said you shouldn't have done that. Now confess it and make it right. Are y'all with me? You see, the Spirit's in there working on you. From the moment you get saved, from the moment you begin your walk with Christ, he's working on you. He's taking stuff out of you. He's putting stuff in you. He's clearing things, and he's moving things, and he's, are y'all with me? That's why you're never the same. That's why, that's why a person who's been born again and tries to go back out into this world and live the life they used to live, they're the most, they're the most miserable individual on the planet. Because they can't go back to what they used to be because they took somebody with them. And he won't let them enjoy the nights. He won't let them enjoy the drinking. He won't let them enjoy the craziness that they come out of. And then they come around y'all and y'all are happy and they're miserable and they're more miserable because you're happy. And they just can't get anywhere and have joy. You see, the Holy Spirit's working on us, working on us. Working on us. So we, we have the Spirit to help us with this process, right? We have the Holy Spirit to help us with this process. But then, write this down. We have the Scriptures. We have the Scriptures to help us with this process. Look what, look what Jesus said. Look what Jesus said in his prayer in John 17. <clears throat> in John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify, say that with me. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now watch this here. It's a great verse to explain. Ephesians 5.25. Ephesians 5.25. Everybody there say amen. It says, husbands, love your wives 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, why did Christ give himself for the church? Watch this. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having or, or any, but that they should be holy and without blemish. Preacher, what are you saying? This word is like water that cleanses. It washes your mind. Listen, the, 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 the scriptures, he said, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Now, you, you know, <clears throat> I, I really wanted to talk about uh, Romans 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. And since we started, you know, last Sunday with that verse 1, I'm going to try to jump into that verse 2 next, uh, this coming Sunday. Maybe, possibly, if the Lord let me. But, but there is a transformation that takes place, right? And the word means metamorphio. And we, we know the word metamorphosis, like the, the butterfly, the caterpillar turning into the cocoon. There's a butterfly in the cat, inside the caterpillar that eventually comes out. I mean, that's the, that's the point. That, that our outside will eventually change because of what's on the inside. And what helps that process? The scriptures. Be not conformed. The word conformed there means pressed into a mold. Thus, you see, the world will apply pressure. Y'all notice that? The world wants to pressure you into believing what they believe in and thinking what's okay is what they think is okay and, and, and their lifestyle and their beliefs and their behaviors and, and they're doing everything they can to enforce it on believers. But it says don't be pressured. Don't be conformed to this world. But be ye transformed. Now, watch this. Where's the area of the transformation? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. mind. Now, how do we renew our mind? How do we renew our mind? We fill it with the, the, word. the word. And as our mind is flooded with scriptures, guess what? Things start to change. Your mind changes about things. Now, let's think about this. Everybody look at me. Everybody wake up. 21 minutes, 21 minutes is what I got. All right, think about this. How many of y'all can remember the way you thought about things before you got saved? A little different, isn't it? Now, think about this, think about this. How many of y'all remember the moment you got saved from that point to where you are now because of all the learning and growing you've done? What's happened? There's been a change. Some of it's slower, some of it's faster, but there's been a change in the way you think. There's been a change in how you feel. There's been a change. There's a transformation changing. What's, what's being transformed? You're starting to think more and act more and live more like his son. It's, it's like it says from glory to glory. We gaze at his son. We gaze at his son. How do we gaze at his son? Through the word. You see, he's the living word. This is the written word. And the more we know the written word, the more we know the living word. Does that make sense? And so this whole, that, that, that's why it's so important that we come and do this. We're, this is not just so we can take an attendance. And, and, and there's, this, this place should be full of people. Because they need the process. They need the transformation. And the more you know about his son, the more you're transformed into his image. It takes knowledge. It takes growth. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. But that's not all. That's not all. Now, some of y'all ain't going to like this next one, but it is what it is. <laughs> now, now, he's given us some things to help us, right? To become more like his son. That's his purpose. That's what he wants us to be. That's the process of sanctification. He's still working on me, right? Amen. What was the first thing? He's given us spirit. the spirit that works on the inside. Then he's given us the scriptures. scriptures. Watch this right here. Watch this right here. Verse, verse 28. Verse 28. And we know that all things, all things 
You say, what is all things? That's the situations. Y'all know I had to alliterate it. The situations. What is a situation? A flat tire. A disgruntled employee. A bad news report. A bad doctor's visit. A cancellation in the mail. Termination papers. A bankruptcy. A divorce. Listen. A foreclosure. Preacher, what is that? It's all things. Now, here's what you got to get. <clears throat> Nothing. Everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. Nothing randomly happens to believers. Nothing. All things means all things. And all things are filtered through the hands of the Savior who's sanctifying you. And you have to know that every situation, everything, all things, everything, every situation you experience and you go through and you have to deal with is God working on you, molding you, developing you, strengthening you. Watch this. Sometimes breaking you. Peter, Peter had so much potential. Jesus looked at him one day. Jesus looked at him one day and said, said, whom do men say that I am? You know, some of them said, some Elias, some John the Baptist, one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? This is what Peter said. We believe that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That was his confession. Man, that tickled Jesus. He said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And unto thee I give the keys of the kingdom. What you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. What you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What did he do with Peter? He just said, you've got potential. I've got a plan for you. He, listen, he planned for Peter to stand on the day of Pentecost and preach and see thousands saved. And Peter was the, one of the, the biggest sources and helps to establish the early church. He was the main character of the book of Acts until Paul come upon the scene in the second half of Acts. But there was a problem. Peter was full of himself. He's arrogant, cocky, too confident, not humble. At all. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no, no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He what? He humbled himself. Became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Well, that was Christ. That doesn't describe Peter. <laughs> we know the story. Peter's kind of a smart aleck. Jesus tries to tell him what's going to happen. The shepherd's going to be smitten and the sheep are going to scatter. Not me. They all, not me. Oh, Peter. You see, Peter, your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. Satan has desired to have thee. He may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you. No! The Bible says Peter got vehement. He got angry. But what happened to Peter? He 
You got sifted. They come and arrest Jesus. Y'all know what happens. Peter denies him three times, and look, look what happens. Look what happens. He wept bitter. He was so broken. When you study that, that phrase, weep, weep bitterly, it means he cried so much he had no more tears to shed. That's broken. But guess what? Humble thyself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. You see, we can look at that as, as that's bad. But the sifting of Peter, God allowing Satan to get his paws on Peter was all things. Now, now Satan thought he was really doing a number on Peter when in, when in reality he was just a tool in the hand of our Lord to get Peter humble like he needed to be. Boy, I'm almost ready to shout right there. And then what happened? Peter stands on the day of Pentecost and preaches and thousands get saved. Peter's able to record scriptures and say this, for all the rest of you, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil's as a roaring lion who roams the bow seeking whom he may devour. Right. Now why Peter? Because Peter still had claw marks, amen. Yeah. <laughs> you see, those are all things. Preacher, why am I going through what I'm going through? It's all things. You see, it's bad things, and it's good things. Sometimes it's sad things, and sometimes it's happy things. But God will use all, say it with me, God will use all, all things. Now, this don't apply to lost people. You see, that's where, you know, you see people posting it on Facebook all the time, not even a believer. And they'll post, Romans 8, 28, all things going to be okay. Now, let's, let's think about this. Watch this now. Go back to 828. For we know that all things work together for good. Now, he says, to who? Who does this apply to? Them that. Now, if you don't love God, this don't apply to you. If you're not born again, if you're not a believer... If you're not a child of God, if you've never been justified. You see, the point of this verse is not so everybody can have a feel-good feeling about their bad day. God is trying to describe to you that the stuff happening in your life is just part of the process of sanctification, which is him molding you into the image of his son. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You see, we're all there. We're all there. Every day of your life, the Spirit is working on you. Every day of the, your life, as I preach the Word, God is molding you and he's changing you. He's transforming you. Some of you slower than others, but you're getting there. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And sometimes the hell you go through and the happiness you go through. I seen an illustration. I gotta hurry. I seen an illustration they, 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 of, of a pharmacist who takes different ingredients to make one medicine. And they said if you would take this one medicine and separate the ingredients, that some of those ingredients would kill you. But when they're mixed just right, they don't kill, they promote healing. You see, that's what God does. Those things that come into your life, even the things the devil instigates, God is so mighty and God is so powerful. How about Joseph? He told his brothers, all this you did to me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for you see, even the devil can't work against you. The devil can bring schemes against you to attack you, but God just saying, that's right, that's what I need in his life right now because I'm going to use that to 
You may be in a pit right now, but one day you're going to sit in a palace. That's a reference to Joseph, by the way. If you don't know it, you ought to go read it. It's pretty good. And all God's people say it. All right, first of all, God's purpose for your life is for you, number one, to be justified. Justification is an act. It's an act. He declares you righteous. Come on now. Come on. He declares you righteous. Sanctification is a process. It's a process of him conforming you to the image of his, his son. And he uses the spirit. He uses the scriptures. He uses the situations in your life. But guess what? The title. I'm not what I, but I'm not what I'm. It's the best part. You see, God's plan for you is for you to be justified. God's plan for you is for you to be sanctified. But God's plan for you is to be glorified. Glorification. Let's look at that quickly. Let's look at that quickly. Glorification. Here's, here's Webster's Dictionary, 1828 Webster's Dictionary. The act of giving glory or ascribing honors to. Exaltation to honor and what? Now, two things I want you to write down. First of all, there's going to be a bodily glorification. Write that word down. We're going to receive a glorified body. Hallelujah. The more I blow my nose, the more I'm going to appreciate that. <laughs> Philippians 3, 20, <clears throat> verse 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall, come on everybody, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his, his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be... For we shall see him as he is. Now, I, I don't have the time I wanted to, but I knew I'd run out by the time I got here to really describe the glorified body. The Bible says that, that this, this corruptible is going to put on incorruption. We're going to receive a glorified body that will not be corrupt. It will not die. It will not degrade. All right? It, it will not be limited to gravity. It will not be limited to obstacles. Jesus would appear and disappear. But he still was able to eat honey. And, and are y'all with me? Uh, gravity couldn't hold him. He stepped on a cloud and went to glory. Acts chapter 1. Church, say amen. amen. But the main thing is, is we're going to have a brand new body that don't hurt no more. All right? Now watch this. And don't sin no more neither. Say amen. amen. Can't be tempted to sin. But then there, we're going to be glorified spiritually. Spiritually. And I'm going to describe this. What does it mean? We're going to share in the glory of Christ. Hebrews 2, 9, and 10. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, for it became him for whom are all things by him, or excuse me, by whom are all things, read it with me, in bringing many sons unto, unto glory. Unto glory. Now, I, I put in, in your notes these verses, but I didn't have room to put it because I had to go to page three and I ain't doing that. So I just printed it off for me. So I'll just read it for you. All right. Here's Romans eight sixteen. Here's Romans eight sixteen. 
The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Say amen. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Watch this now. Is it up here? It is up here. Watch this. For I reckon that the suffering, no matter what you go through on this earth, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now watch this, watch this. 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also, read it with me, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Watch this now, watch this now. Colossians 3, 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in what? In glory. Now, when, before, when I read that verse, I would think, okay, we'll appear with him in glory, meaning heaven. You know, because we always, we always... Um, we, the, you know, we, the terminology the old timers use that, well, he's done went on to, went on to glory and calling heaven glory. That's not what that means. That's not what that means. A little glimpse of his glory was found on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember when Peter, James, and John went with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? They're asleep and they wake up and Jesus is glowing. What's happening? They're seeing his inward glory shining on the outside. That's glory. Glory is not reverencing heaven. It's talking about his radiant beauty, his glory, his splendor. Say amen. amen. And the Bible says we're going to share in that. We're going to be glorified just like he is glorified. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Now I know, I know that's going to be hard to, to, to fathom, but let me, let me describe it this way. Uh, John Piper he, he, he said it this way to help us understand what this means. His glory, what is his glory that we're going to share in, we're going to experience? His glory is the brightness and the nature of the creator of the universe. What does the Bible say? Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Let me read that again. Who be, this is Jesus, this is Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Who? Of the creator. His glory is the brightness and the nature of the creator of the universe. We're going to take on the character of Christ. His glory, his glory is the sum of, in other words, when you add it all up, his glory is the sum of all the beauties of love and wisdom and power that he revealed in his earthly life. Where do we see that? John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, everything you see about Jesus, all his glorious attributes, all the love, all of the beauty, all of the wisdom, all of the power, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. His glory, his glory is the triumph of every battle he wins over all his personal, global, and universal enemies. We find that in Revelation 5, 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. His glory is the eternal, watch this now. His glory is the eternal radiance of the light of God replacing the sun and the moon forever. Revelation 21, 23 and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb, and the Lamb, that's Jesus, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Y'all picking up what I'm putting down? 
heaven is transparent. Think about it. Read it. Study it. Why is it transparent? Because God's light, his glory is going to radiate through the whole place. The Bible says we'll have no need of the sun nor the moon. No external light. Why? Because his glory is going to be that light. Guess what? You're going to take part in that. He says, I'm not only going to justify you, I'm going to sanctify you, and one day I'm going to I know we're late, but i got to do something. <clears throat> I'm going to show you how significant this is. Uh, I need, I need, I need, Willie, come on. Johnny, come on. Mark, will you help me? All right. Here's my illustration. Here's my illustration, guys. This is where I was going. If y'all need to do whatever you need to do with the cameras. All right. All right. Uh, uh, Fairview, I need you to pay close attention. I don't know how this is going to work. I hope this works out where you see it. They said they could do it, so here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. All right, uh, uh, <laughs> this is gonna be, this is gonna be Hitler. <clears throat> this guy, I'm sorry, Willie. Okay, that's gonna be Hitler. All right, Hitler's probably, in, in all all consideration, he's probably the worst human being ever lived. Closest to the Antichrist of Judas we can imagine, I can think of. All right, so we'll just say that's the worst. Okay, then we've got, then we've got. Uh, Jesus over here. <clears throat> We've got Jesus over here. All right? Jesus is the very opposite of the spectrum. Right? He's the worst. He's the, he's the best, right? Here we've got the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Now, if, if, if we was to all line up everybody that's ever been born, that's ever walked with on this planet, that was holy, righteous, and as close to Jesus, as close to Jesus as possible, we, could we say it was the Apostle Paul? I would agree. But where would we put the Apostle Paul on the spectrum? I'll tell you where. Even though Hitler is the worst and Paul is miles, miles ahead of Hitler compared to the glory of Christ. Y'all see this big gap? But when we get saved and when he comes again, we're going to partake. We're going to partake in his glory, which means his perfection, his beauty, his, are y'all with me? We're not just going to see it, we're going to partake in it. Are y'all with me? This is way better than what y'all are amen. How many of y'all are glad one day we're going to be glorified? Come on, give him praise and glory. All right. I'm five minutes over time. Lord Jesus, let's stand. Let's stand. Hurry, everybody. Let's stand. Good job, guys. Even you, Hitler. All right. I hope, I hope you guys at Fairview, I hope that worked out. I, I, I pray that y'all were able to see that. If not, I'll, I'll show Tim and he can show y'all Sunday that illustration, all right? But one day, one day, even though the best we can possibly be on this planet, we're so far away from the glory of God, but one day we're going to be there. We're going to ex experience it. We're going to partake in it. We're going to receive and be a part of Jesus' glory. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time cannot be compared with the, with the glory of shall be revealed in us. Amen. And all God's people say it. Amen.